Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today I'm speaking with one of the most well-known defence lawyers in the world, who's made a name for himself by representing some of the most controversial clients imaginable, including Mike Tyson, Klaus von Bühler, O.J. Simpson, Julian Assange, Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein. He's been a professor at Harvard Law School, he's written a stream of books, and we're still scratching the surface. Let's hear my conversation with Alan Dershowitz. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I've lived a long life. I turned 82 just yesterday, and oh, happy I birthday. broke my record of walking. I walked 11 miles yesterday uh, to celebrate my 82 years to try to stay in shape. So, are you in the city now? Are you in Miami? No, uh, in Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> okay, all right. So that's beautiful walking country. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. What I wanted to start with, just to break the ice, was to talk about the similarities that just occurred to me this morning between the songwriting that I do and the work of a lawyer. Because the way you do, you get, you receive a case, a brief, and you, you have to structure the argument of your case and define the main argument for your defense. And you have to, to look for a special angle or to frame it, you know, be it a, based on the glove, a telephone call, or a witness's point of view. So that's the kind of the way I do with songwriting is to look and see what's the special angle here lyrically that I can. And there's uh, another that is we both have as our audience, uh, the average member of the public. Um, I think the key to my success as a lawyer is I know how to talk to ordinary people. I grew up on the streets of Brooklyn. Um, I was not an elitist. Um, my parents were not college educated. Um, I learned how to talk and listen to ordinary folks. Um, and when I take a complex and technical legal case, I need to boil it down, not quite to a five minute song, but to perhaps a 15 minute oral argument. So uh, our, our, our roles are somewhat similar in that respect also. Oh, also, yeah. I love music and I work to music. Um, I actually have different kinds of music for different kinds of work that I do. Um, when I'm just reading something casually, I listen to opera. But when I'm writing, I can't listen to opera because I get too involved. So when I'm writing, I have to listen to kind of familiar classical music that is predictable, that I know that after ba 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 will come bomb. So I'm not taken by surprise. Uh, so uh, music surrounds me all the time, but different music for different tasks. Oh, wonderful. And have you ever written poems or music? Well, you know, I'm writing an opera. Um, but oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I project, if I ever get time to complete it, there's never been an opera written about the Holocaust. Okay. And the story is about a cantor, uh, a Jewish singer, great singer. Uh, it's a true story. Um, who, uh, during the Holocaust, was given the choice to come to America and escape and decided to remain with his family and his congregation in the Warsaw Ghetto and was uh, murdered in 1943. So it's about the opera is about his choice and his decision. And it's called by the Hebrew word Hineni, which means here I stand, here I stay, here I stand. Um, and um, it's, uh, I've been working on it for a while. Um, mostly I would probably just write the libretto and some suggestions for musical themes and leave it to people better educated than me to um, write the actual music. <laughs> oh, well, it's the same with I do. I write the basic structure and then I go to, I get other musicians to play with me. But when you're, you know, as a lawyer to go back to that, do you, how do you, so you, that's a great point you had that you, you know, you talk to the every man and uh, so that they, you know, what, what they can, they can understand about it. So when you taught at Harvard Law School, how do you, is that, was that part of your teaching? Yeah, very much so. And I was trying to teach my students the same thing. I was trying to teach them how to take complex arguments and um, reduce them to words and terms and concepts that were understandable to the average person. And um, sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes issues are so complex. 
I mean, for example, when I recently um, argued against the impeachment of President Trump, I was a, not a Trump supporter at all. I was a supporter of Hillary Clinton. I'm a liberal Democrat. But I didn't believe that the constitutional criteria uh, for impeachment had been met. And so I was really defending the Constitution. I worked very hard to try to frame my arguments in ways that were understandable to the average TV watcher and to the average United States senator that was my audience. And I tried to avoid, you know, complicated legalistic notions. And um, did I succeed or not? Well, people can agree or disagree. If people hate Trump, they didn't think I did a particularly good job, although some think I did too good a job if they really hated Trump. But <laughs> you know, my goal was to try to persuade senators to shake their heads and say, yeah, that sounds logical. That sounds reasonable. And so that's what I try to do. I guess the problem you had there was that you had to talk for an hour and then the media decided which bits they cut together to... I'm filing a lawsuit against CNN because basically what I said at the argument was this. I said, if a president does anything illegal, he can be impeached. But if he just does something in order to get reelected, he can't be impeached. They left out the first part that says if he does something illegal, he can be impeached and just played over and over again that if he does something to be reelected, he can't be impeached. Making And then said that I had said that he can do anything illegal to get elected. So they wrenched it out of context. They uh, basically doctored the tape, doctored the recording. So uh, I've never... I had never until a few years ago ever brought a lawsuit or been sued. The first 75 years of my life, I had never been involved in any kind of legal proceeding. And the last five years of my life, that's all I've been doing is suing and being sued. So it's a strange way to end one's career at age 82. It is. But I think we both know the mistake you now made is that you didn't sing the speech because if you've been singing it, it's much harder to cut up. Well, you know, I actually did sing once in front of a court. Um, I was representing the musical Hair, um, oh, yeah. and musical Hair was being censored because of nudity. And uh, there's a song in Hair that goes something like this. How dare they try to stop our music? How dare they try to stop our music? I sang it to the court. Okay. And I said, that's our argument. How dare you try to stop our music? Uh, this is all about freedom of expression, freedom of speech. So, you know, I'll do anything to win a case. I'll, <laughs> stand and, uh, I'll jump through hoops as long as I do it ethically and properly. Because you have this, you know, I mean, you have this wonderful retirement. Now you're, you're 82, as you say. And so why did you go back into this, um, into the, the, lion, uh, what, the lion's den or whatever you want to call it to, to, yeah. to, to get involved in this impeachment, impeachment case? Well, you know, I've been involved in the impeachment of Bill Clinton. I defended him as well. I was part of the legal team and I was part of the legal team in Bush versus Gore. I've always defended Democrats, but for me, it was a point to principle. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought Trump had done some uh, things that I fundamentally disagreed with, but it, they didn't reach the level of of a constitutionally impeachable offense. So I thought as a matter of principle, it was important for me to do it. And I never fully retired. I only retired from teaching and I retired at 75 while I was still vibrant mm -hmm. in order to be able to have a new career. And, you know, I've been litigating a lot of cases now around the world. Um, and uh, so this was kind of a natural case for me to be involved in. It, you know, created a lot of animosity. Uh, friends abandoned me, stopped talking to me, even some relatives. Um, but, uh, you know, that's happened to other lawyers throughout history as well uh, when they've defended people. When I defended O.J. Simpson, a few people stopped talking to me, but it wasn't nearly as bad as it was with the case of President Trump. I saw the, uh, I mean, you know, you're, if you weren't famous before, I mean, you know you are now. I mean, the Saturday Night Live open with a whole skit about you. I mean, it's... Uh... Be hell i mean being uh, being in hell right? <laughs> on a podcast i mean so what does that right. make me i mean that... yeah it's true yeah special but place did... <laughs> podcaster but did you did you pick up the phone and call the white house or did they come to you or how does this oh, thing work they came, they came of course not i never i've never picked up the phone ever to ask okay. for a case uh, <laughs> that you know the white house called and the president personally called and then the president met with me and my wife and my initial inclination was to say no. And, um, and then as a result of uh, 
looking deeply into the case, I changed my mind. Um, you know, I still have mixed feelings about it because it has caused me a lot of personal grief oh, yeah. and personal friends. And mostly I feel ambivalent because of what it did to my family. I have, you know, my grandchildren and my children are part of a generation that is just hates Trump. They think he is the worst thing that ever happened to America. And they see me as uh, his savior. Um, my feeling is that it's much better if you don't like a president to vote against him. That's what elections are for. Impeachment is reserved for special circumstances, which I didn't think were satisfied in this case. No, I've listened to it and I thought you did a great job. And, you know, it was very clear. And um, uh, but do you think Trump will win the next election? What's the feeling in America? Uh, the feeling in America is he's not going to win that um, he uh, that the pandemic really sealed his fate. Um, that people were expecting that he would be able to handle it in a much more effective fashion. And so I think the polls now show that he is considerably behind. On the other hand, he was considerably behind um, four years ago this month. I actually wrote four years ago in August, not September. In August, I wrote that I thought he might win the election. Okay. Um, and so I, I turned out to be right then. I think now it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult for him to win. Okay, so does this because your last book was how I how I left the left the left but can't join the right. So right. Are, are you go, would you vote for Joe Biden? I'm not going to publicly indicate who I'll vote for, but I do. I've never voted for a Republican in my life. Okay. I have voted from the time I voted for John Kennedy to the time I voted for Hillary Clinton. I've always voted Democrat. I am a liberal Democrat. Mm -hmm. So you can judge for yourself, but I'm not going to publicly reveal my vote at this point okay no i mean it must be you have this two-party system in um in america and it's very centralized it's always you know if you go left or right it's never very much is it i mean you're always in britain it's two and a half party system so it's not <laughs> so different um and uh you know what's happening in america happened a little bit in great britain i mean the corbynization of the labor party spelled its defeat and uh, I think Joe Biden represents the non corporatization of the American Democratic Party. He is a more centrist candidate. Uh, he's much more like Tony Blair was to the Labor Party, um, not nearly as dynamic as Tony Blair and as charismatic as Tony Blair. Or, <laughs> or as young. <laughs> or young. Uh, um, he made the same mistake Tony Blair did, and that is he supported the Iraq War. Um, which ended the career of Tony, of Tony Blair, um, but did not end the career of, uh, of Joe Biden. Okay. What do you think about, because you're an 82-year-old man now, you can say, I mean, what these, these, we have two quite old men running against each other. Yeah, I think, think of them as quite young men. I think of them as young. They're all in their, both in their 70s. So <laughs> I don't think old used to describe either, either Trump or uh, or Biden, or the people who ran against them. The man closest in age to me was probably uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, yeah. Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, we, Britain used to have that system um, where, you know, people were quite old. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. how old was Winston Churchill when he finally oh, yeah. left off Benjamin Disraeli? Um, uh, and then the, you went through a period with Tony Blair and with... Uh, some others who were quite young and uh, uh now now you you have somebody who is how old is he he's in his 60s probably boris johnson yeah. right yeah for sure i mean you you've had come through so much i mean i was going to think was going to mention to you if you if you were nervous doing this senate speech but you were probably looking around there and you were seeing all these ex-students that's you know. true come on some on the Democrat side, some on the Republican side. Uh, and a number of them came over to me afterward, even Democrats, and uh, you know, praised my performance, although they uh, disagreed with, with me. But it was interesting to see how many former students were there in among the senators, uh, quite a few. Yeah, okay, well, so, so you, you know, you're, 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 still, you're still heavily involved with politics. I mean, do you... Is it, I mean, you still obviously enjoy it. Uh, you're still taking cases. I mean, you still have so much energy. Do you not want to just retire and uh, 
Now, I've never wanted to just retire. Uh, what I didn't want to have to do was litigate my own cases and have to defend my reputation against false charges. I didn't think that would be how I would end my uh, career. And the reason I walk so much every day is I want to remain healthy and alive long enough to win my case and to prove to the world that I never even met the woman who falsely accused me for money. Um, she herself has admitted it on, in, in, in emails that she tried to suppress and uh, in uh, conversations with close friends and to her own lawyer uh, who has said that it was impossible for her to have been in the places she said she met me. So the evidence is absolutely overwhelming that I never met this woman, but people believe it because they want to believe it. Partly they believe it because they don't like me because of the Trump matter. Mm -hmm. Partly they believe it because they say all women should be believed. No women ever lie. Women are born with a genetic predisposition to tell the truth and men are born with a genetic predisposition to lie. So all of these come together and a lot of people believe that I engaged in sexual misconduct and I never have. I've been married to the same woman for 34 years from the day I met Jeffrey Epstein till today. I've touched one woman sexually and that's my wife. I've never had sex with an underage person in my life. Even when I was an underage boy, I didn't. <laughs> Under, I tried, but I failed. <laughs> uh, all guys in my generation tried and failed. I don't think we really even tried. We were supposed to pretend to try. We probably would have been terrified if it actually had happened. So, you know, uh, I grew up in an age when you didn't have premarital sex. And um, uh, the idea of me having sex with anybody related to Jeffrey Epstein is totally preposterous. But people believe it. And I have to defend myself and I have to go to court and litigate this case. No, well, I mean, you always defend yourself so well. You, you, you wrote another book about the, the Me Too yeah, movement. Guilt. To, to... Yeah. yeah, the challenge of proving innocence in the age of Me Too. Yeah, because these days with the way the, the media goes so quickly, it's, it's a wildfire and it's, uh, you're, you're guilty with accusation as you... Churchill, who said a lie makes its way around the world while the truth is trying to put its shoes on. Today with the internet, you can't even find your shoes. Um, uh, a lie goes around the world literally instantaneously. Um, I was accused on the night before New Year's, um, New Year's of 2015, and you know, no newspapers were operating. It was basically New Year's Eve. Uh, of course, it was leaked to the press by my opponents, and it was in newspapers all around the world the very next day with the accusation. And um, when I denied it, then I was sued for defamation for denying it. So that's the litigation that we're now facing. But do you have some, because you, obviously the, you know, you've written about the Me Too movement, do you have some sympathy? Because, you know, it, with Cuddy kind of had these double whammy, the, the um, Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein and Epstein, um, who had gone on for their, their nefarious ways for many years, yeah. um, kind of um, not, not assisted by the system or people, but they weren't, I mean, people must have known something. They, oh, yeah. No, I don't, think they don't exist in a vacuum. We, uh, we didn't know anything about Epstein. None of us. I mean, not the president of Harvard, not the Nobel Prize winners who hung around. We knew he liked women in their 20s, but we had no idea of what he was doing to um, much younger women. I have real sympathy for real actual victims. Uh, what I don't have is sympathy for people who use uh, false claims of victimization to try to enrich themselves. And they actually hurt the movement terribly uh, because their lies are going to be exposed. And then it will create issues of credibility for real victims. So they hurt real, real victims. I'm very sympathetic to real victims. When I win my case, I will contribute much of the proceeds to charity. I'll divide it half for people who are true victims of sexual abuse and the other half a victim for people who have been falsely accused. But do you think there's some sort of I don't know, like some sort of the strength of the reaction is sort of pent up over like also with the Black Lives Movement, you know, that it's for many, many years of sort of this, this, this build up yeah. and this oppression. And well, then you get a reaction. Uh, America is, uh, I'm not sure I can say this about other countries, but the pendulum swings very, very widely. Um, first, we have years and years and years of tolerating and facilitating sexual abuse. And then suddenly the pendulum swings 
and nobody's innocent, everybody's guilty. The same thing with Black Lives Matter. Uh, for years, we've accepted uh, as, as, as a, an unfortunate a reality that police do uh, use excessive force and they use it disproportionately against uh, minorities. Uh, and now uh, the, the reaction is that the police can do nothing right and that every case is a case of police misconduct. And we're not a nation of nuance. We're not a nation of calibration. We're not a nation <laughs> that looks carefully at the specific facts. We're either on one side or the other. You choose your side. It's like, you know, Liverpool versus Arsenal. You just, you have to pick a team and uh, your team can do no wrong and your opposing team can do no right. And that's not the way a legal or a political system should operate. It's okay for sports. In fact, I've never even been that way in sports. I'm a Boston Red Sox fan, and yet I have tremendous admiration for uh, baseball stars on the other team, for New York Yankees and uh, other players. So I think you can be nuanced even in sports rooting. But isn't that sort of or like the legal system you work in is very adversarial. So very adversarial. Well, sports are adversarial too. But, mm. you know, when I get out of court and I've argued a case against a very good lawyer, I go over to them and I congratulate them and say, what a great job you did um, professionally. And I think, you know, you see that among great athletes, um, even when they lose, they go over to the person who beat them and they shake hands, sometimes hug them and, uh, tell them what a great job they did. Uh, there's no inconsistency between being very adversarial and also appreciating the professionalism on the other side. Did you ever think of working as a prosecutor as well? Or? I only did it once um, uh, for one case. Um, um, uh, a, a prosecutor in Florida asked me to help keep in prison um, a former FBI agent who had uh, been accused of arranging the murder of an informant um, who uh, the former age, the former FBI agent was basically working for Whitey Bulger, uh, the mass murderer. And I thought that he did was so terrible as an FBI agent that I basically switched sides for the one case. And I successfully helped the prosecutor keep him in prison. Okay. Wow. Um, so I also heard you're working to, just to, because I have to write a song about you and about your ideas and so it's probably your, the way you're thinking at the moment. I heard you're writing a book about democracy. Um, the net title of your next book. The next book is, uh, which I finished, it's now in the publisher, um, is, is called Cancel Culture. Uh, okay. Cancel Culture, the Death of Due Process and Freedom of Speech. Okay. So I'm, I'm finishing that. And then I've just started another book called The Preventive State. I have the, the draft right in front of me. Um, the preventive state, the challenge of predicting and preventing cataclysmic harms without granting too much power to government. So again, I, all my books, I tried to balance. I tried to strike the appropriate balance. I'm not somebody who says I'm always against everything preventive or I'm always in favor of everything preventive. I try to create a balance and nuance. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't. Did you ever think of trying to be like an attorney general or to move up in, in that way? No, um, I never wanted to work for the government. Uh, the last time I worked for the government, last time I got a government check is when I was like 23 years old and I worked <laughs> as a Supreme Court law clerk um, for the for justice of the Supreme Court. I was offered a job by Bobby Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, to become uh, his special assistant. Um, and I decided I wanted to be a professor rather than a government official. I don't know whether it was the right decision or not. I probably would have benefited from a few years in the government or a few years being a prosecutor, but I decided to become a professor. And so I was the youngest professor ever in the history of Harvard and the oldest person ever to argue in favor of a president at a Senate impeachment. So I've been the youngest and the oldest. And uh, that's a uh, feeling. So what is it like? Um, because you're the, I mean, I live, I live in the South of Italy, so I'm about, I'm about 50 miles away from where Cicero had his, had well, his summer house. One of the most beautiful parts of the world. I love it. It's the place we go to vacation always. Well, you can come and retire here. I mean, a month's rent in Martha's Vineyard would buy you uh, Cicero's yeah. ex-place, I'm sure. So, uh -huh. but, but uh, so do you, I mean, do you see, he's like, a, I could see you as like a Cicero character sort of, you know, defending the Republic basically. 
Well, I don't think of myself as a Cicero character because I'm not a warrior, but I, I mean, the, the name of the book I wrote about um, my appearance in front of the Senate was Defending the Constitution. You know, I never mentioned President Trump's name in my entire speech. Um, what I talked about was the Constitution and why the Constitution shouldn't be stretched to cover conduct, which the framers of the Constitution never intended it to cover. And I went back into English law and to Blackstone and so it is defending the Constitution rather than defending a particular individual. Okay, but I mean, is it, you know, that, that seems to be the, the theme in your work is defending this. Yeah, yeah. No, look, I was born to be a defense attorney. I was arguing, my mother says I was arguing as I came <laughs> home. And uh, I argued with all of my teachers. I argued with my rabbis. I argued with everybody except my parents. I never argued with my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was brought up very respectful of my parents. My parents were not college educated and I never wanted to be a bully. I never wanted to take advantage of my education in arguing with my parents. I only try to argue with people who are more powerful than I am, richer than I am, more influential than I am. I like to argue up rather than down. Okay. I was interesting. I read, uh, heard you talk about your book, Rights from Wrongs. And I was very interested in this idea you had about Everyone agrees on utopia. Everyone agrees on this. Did the dystopia, but utopia is, is have a wide, widely right. Different, uh, no, I think that's from. right. Get a hundred people in a room and ask them about slavery, the Holocaust, um, even more recent wrongs like uh, sexism, homophobia. You'd get extraordinarily widespread agreement as to the horrors of these dystopic uh, considerations. But then if you ask them what constitutes perfect justice, you'd get a hundred different answers. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the Bible says, justice, justice must you pursue. It uses the word justice twice. Justice, justice must you pursue. In Hebrew, it's tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. And so I've often been asked what my interpretation is. And, and, and my interpretation is there's no one justice. There's no one form of justice. There are at least multiple forms of what would be perfect justice. I can imagine a perfect socialist utopia. We've never had it. I can imagine a perfect free market utopia. We've never had it. I can imagine a mixed Scandinavian type utopia. Maybe they've come close to having it, but the suicide rates are very high in that country. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no perfect justice, but there is perfect injustice. So what is... The when, I've heard the reason that you take, because uh, you've taken many, you know, O.J. Simpson and, and Epstein and many, many others. And right. the reason you take these cases is because, you know, you don't care about your reputation, but you, you want to defend the undefendable. You, you right. put it much better than I, I'm putting it, obviously. You're a yeah, no, uh, for me, defending the indefensible, defending those who nobody else will defend is what I am obliged to do, particularly since I was a professor with tenure. So I couldn't lose my job by doing it. Of course, today in universities, people are losing their jobs. My friend Ron Sullivan, who was the dean of a college at Harvard, lost his deanship because he represented Harvey Weinstein for a brief period of time. And his students said they felt unsafe, unsafe in the presence of a professor. Uh, it's absurd. But the school took it uh, seriously. Yeah, OK. Um... What else did I want to ask you about? Well, um, obviously, um, you do so much work for the for the for the Jewish community, and um, right. um, and you were involved in a new. You're in the two state solution. You're drawing a new roadmap for peace in Israel. Um, well, I'm in favor of the two state solution. In fact, there was a period of time Haaretz had a big article about it back when it happened where I proposed a formula that Abbas accepted. And, and then I proposed it to Netanyahu, and he seemed to accept it, but it hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, I've, I've been in favor of the two-state solution since 1970, well before the Israeli government was in favor of it. And I've written about it. I've written several books about it. Um, right now, I do half of my cases pro bono. Um, mm -hmm some of them for the Jewish community, some others. I'm representing uh, Julian Assange pro bono um, and trying to help him in his case. He's been indicted in the United States. 
uh, under what I think is a terribly unjust indictment that endangers the First Amendment. Uh, I done a lot of a number of capital cases, uh, death penalty cases, pro bono. And, um, you know, I, I always prided myself throughout my whole career. Um, I've done half of my cases pro bono, half of my causes cases pro bono, and I'll continue to do that. I'm actually up to now about 60%. I do more than half of my cases now pro bono because I have, uh, you know, more, a little bit more time and a little bit more uh, resources to be able to do that. So what do you think will be the solution in, uh, towards the Israeli-Palestine uh, problem? The solution is so obvious and so easy. If only people will sit down and do it, it would be a two-state solution with land swaps to make sure that the Palestinian state is a contiguous state and a viable state, but a disarmed state, not a state with an air force, or an ability to send rockets into Israel. Mm -hmm. um, it will require, for a period of time, an Israeli military presence in the Jordan Valley. But uh, Abbas has already agreed to all of those. He has told me, I had dinner with him not so long ago, in which he told me he agreed to a demilitarized state. He agreed to land swaps. He agreed to end the demand for a full right of return. And so the elements are all there. It just needs the will, the political will, and uh, both sides don't seem to have it. Um, you know, uh, today for an Israeli politician to support the two-state solution is to endanger his office. And for a Palestinian to support a two-state solution is possibly to endanger his life. Um, we, we what happened with people who tried to make peace with Israel. Anwar Sadat obviously was murdered. Um, the king of Jordan's grandfather uh, was murdered because he wanted to make peace with Israel. So peace is easy to achieve theoretically and very difficult to achieve practically. Would you consider representing the Palestinians if you could switch sides and... Uh... I already have. Um, on the day that Yasser Arafat uh, died or the week he died, Palestinian students at Harvard wanted to fly his flag. Um, and Harvard said no, because it wasn't an official state. And the Palestinian students asked me to represent them and I did and we won. And we flew the Palestinian flag, and then I handed out leaflets about what a terrible man Arafat was. So it was a great victory for the First Amendment. They flew their flag praising Arafat. I handed out my leaflets condemning Arafat. <laughs> Every Harvard student could come by and read my leaflets, see the flag, and decide for themselves. That's what freedom of speech is about. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I mean... I've always wondered what it's like to be a because you're the Jewish you have a big community there in in America and you have this state and I mean I'm a, I'm an Englishman I live in Italy I don't have this sort of connection you know but do you think it's I mean is it in some way divisive to be to be in some uh, with your religion grouping you together like this or is it some way I'm different you know is it well, when I grew up, that was probably the case. I grew up in Brooklyn at a time when there were a million Jews living in Brooklyn, and that was the largest Jewish city in the history of the world, larger than Jerusalem ever was at the time, larger than any any city. And uh, so, and we grew up in ghettos. We grew up in little shtetls. Uh, my neighborhood, Borough Park, was almost all Jewish. Uh, the next neighborhood of Bay Ridge was almost all Italian American. Uh, Bedford Stuyvesant was African American. Uh, 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 there was another neighborhood that was Polish American. So we really did live in silos. I think that's changed. Uh, I think today most Jews are secular. They live all over the country um, and uh, they're spread out still dominantly, obviously in three or four places, uh, New York city, uh, Southern Florida, um, Miami, Broward County and Los Angeles. Uh, those are the three dominant Jewish communities, but Jews still form only about 2% of the American population. Uh, you know, they did a poll some years ago and they asked typical Americans who are not Jewish, what percentage of America is Jewish? And the average answer was 20%. Um, <laughs> because, um, you know, uh, we talk a lot. And uh, <laughs> are you? are you're very successful. You work very hard. I mean, our success. We're not, but we're, you know, we're there, we're out there. And so people think we're 20% when we're really 2%. And, um, uh, but, you know, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade being Jewish for anything else because I grew up that way. And, you know, I, I admire my culture and I, I, uh, I'm critical of aspects of it. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I wish, for example, in the coming Jewish holidays, the synagogues would be basically closed and uh, we would respect the pandemic more. Uh, efforts are being made to adapt the synagogue I go to. They're having instead of one service with a thousand people, they're going to have like four or five services, each with a couple of hundred people spread out widely. It's look, it's, it's adaptation. It's good. I, I support it. Um, but um, uh, America is, it's, being Jewish in America is very different today than it was when I was growing up. And uh, it's not as uh, isolating. It's not as ghettoized. It's uh, much more mainstream. We still haven't had a Jewish uh, president. Interestingly enough, the first Jew to come close to being president, uh, Bernie Sanders, was probably the most anti-Israel candidate ever to run for president of the United States. Mm. Uh, that tells you something about what happens to the Jewish community. The Jewish community is not completely uniformly supportive of Israel, um, and it's divided on every issue. Uh, there are Jewish Republicans. The vast majority of Jews are Democrats, and I think Biden will win an overwhelming majority of the Jewish support, even though Trump has been good for Israel. Mm. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's, I mean, you can't, we don't all agree on everything. I mean, if you, if you came over here to, as, if you came over here to Italy as an American, they'd think they'd ask you when or why you voted for Trump and what, you know, what you're doing. And, <laughs> yeah. Look, I remember I got involved in a controversy in Italy over the, over the Amanda Knox case. Um, and oh, you were uh, involved in that, were you? wasn't involved in it, um, but I was not one who thought necessarily that she was completely innocent. I thought it was uh, a closer case, a mixed case, and I got very criticized in America for saying that. Um, I, I, I never was totally convinced that she was completely and totally uh, exculpated from that case. I thought that her role may have been a little bit more complicated, um, but I can't be sure. What does your what does your wife say sometimes? Because you know you put your head above the parapet sometimes, you know, and like you argue for the age of consent or about torture, or you do this you do this speech for Trump. I mean, does she well, the age say ridiculous. The age of consent all over the world is is not eighteen. What is it in Italy? Sixteen and Israel is sixteen and Canada is sixteen and uh, England is sixteen. And so I basically advocated that America accept. This was years ago, years before I ever had any involvement with any of of Epstein or anything like that. I had been arguing this for years that, you know, kids today have sex before they're 18 and we shouldn't give the police the power to pick and choose. And remember the people who were mostly prosecuted under statutory rape cases were African-American young men who were having sex with white women. And uh, white women were 17, 17 and a half and black men were being prosecuted. So I stand by my position. Um, I think it was the right position then. I think it's the right position now. It also is a position that helps support the case for young women having the right to choose abortion. If you're old enough at 17 to choose to have an abortion, I think you're old enough to choose to have consensual sex with somebody your age. So that was my point. So, but it was wrenched out of context and pretended as if I did it to defend myself against charges that I had sex with an underage person, which I never had. Yeah, I yeah. didn't realize you said it way back when. I mean, I guess all these things are... Oh, yeah, no, I back in the, the 80s. And um, as far as torture is concerned, I'm completely categorically opposed to torture, but I think it will happen. If we ever had a ticking bomb case in England and Italy and the United States, we would torture in order to prevent a cataclysmic event. And if we're going to do it, I want to make sure it's done within the rule of law and not outside the rule of law. So that was my proposal. Again, misunderstood. But I've never been afraid to take controversial positions. Up to now, that's all been academic. But once I was falsely accused, then everybody says, ah, he took that position in order to defend himself in anticipation that 20 years in the future, maybe something like that would happen. And he would be able to say, see, I always said the age of consent should be lower than 18. Yeah, or if you get involved in torture. Yeah, you know, yeah. Some or, sort of ticking bomb, then. <laughs> I don't think you have that much foresight, no. But I just meant that, um, you know, because you you know, you know, have this quiet, lovely hope family and this quiet life. Do they say, just shut up, Dad, or just don't? I, my wife says that all the time. She admires me, <laughs> hands up for my principles, but she says, can't you once in a while just leave an issue alone and not get involved? <laughs> and a lot of my friends take the same view, but that's just not who I am.
I mean, and, well, you're just, the, you know, all men like of 82 are like this. You know, they're all spout, you know, if you go to the piazza down in the town here, they're all giving their opinions. It's just people listen to you. So Well, they used to. I'm not sure they still do. When you write, <laughs> people will listen more. So if you can portray me accurately in your song, it will uh, make people want to listen more. Hopefully. Well, I'll definitely try that. I'm really getting across then also from your other interviews that you have this... Um, the spine of principles which hasn't changed throughout the years and uh no i'm boringly consistent um i'm the <laughs> perfect example of emerson uh consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds but that's who i am i'm consistent okay and if there's one you know if there's one philosophy i wouldn't say put on your tombstone because i you know probably be i want to be cremated but i mean what do yeah. you want to be remembered by as a well i think a few things never boring um i think that's true I number one checked. i think we've done that one i think yeah to achieve that <laughs> right. um that i passed the shoe on the other foot test that i'm principled i don't allow partisanship to interfere with my decisions and that um i try my best always to support the underdog we right. have differences who the underdog is um and i don't like right. bullies can't stand bullies although i've defended bullies because sometimes bullies are bullied Mm -hmm. okay just making notes here yeah because it's so difficult with someone like you who has such a long and outstanding career that uh to, to boil it down in, into its essence well well you can write an opera <laughs> yeah i have to do a couple of songs a week here so I uh -huh. to... <laughs> hard right Okay, well, look, Verdi grew up how far away from you? you no, know, he grew up north of Italy, right? Yeah. Who again, sorry? Verdi grew up in Verdi. the north. Oh, of yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but Puccini in the south, right? So. Uh, oh, yes, yeah. No, it's, it's a wonderful historic area. Oh, well, well, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, uh, it really was fun talking to you. And if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to call me. I'm happy to answer anything. Oh, well, one thing. You I have never refused to speak to the media about the accusations against me, unlike Prince Andrew and many of the others, because I have nothing to hide. I have my life's an open book and I have nothing to hide. I do everything out in the open. I have I don't have secrets. So that's why I'm not afraid to speak out. All right. Well, thanks, Alan. It's been great chatting to you and my uh, very so inspiring. Much. Be well. You too. You too. Bye. Bye. -bye. Guilty.
it's proved trial by ordeal without appeal defend the undefendable make complex comprehendable with principles unbendable defend the undefendable make complex comprehendable with principles unbendable thanks for tuning in glad you got this far you must have enjoyed it if you could just give a little back by tapping the rating icon on your podcast app or writing a review that would be wonderful if you like the song you can listen to it on spotify itunes deezer anywhere it's also available for sale on our website and that money goes to support the musicians massimino vozza and maurizio san nicola and thanks again to Dory Verbo, my researcher. See you next time.